Hello and welcome back once again to Rage Gaming and more Dragon's Dogma 2. Today we're continuing our Things You Might Not Know series. Interesting, weird, particularly useful stuff. This time we have more from the comments and also the general community at large. So once again, a big thank you to everyone who gets involved and makes suggestions in the comments. With that said, let's just get right to it. First up, did you know that the Unmaking Arrow, that single use, four save upon use, one shot arrow, works exactly how you might hope on the final boss of the game. Yes, insanely, you can use the unmaking arrow on the dragon. In fact, you don't need to wait until the fight. You can just do it when you have that choice to walk away, to attack it or whatever. It will instantly kill it and so instantly end the game, which is fantastic. It's the type of thing I think most people might think of, maybe even on the first playthrough, but never actually do that because you might miss out on a lot if you don't actually choose to run or stay or fight. Instead of doing any of that, you could pull out the old I win arrow and shoot it straight the pot thing. Credit to appropriate Bill who posted their footage of doing exactly this so we could see it on the Dragon's Dogma Reddit. As discussed in the comments in that post, you could of course kill the dragon before the real fight in the original game too, so it's cool to see a design like that come back. Obviously once you do this, the dragon's going to be counted as defeated like normal, even though you've not really challenged it and rode it to the real fight location. Once you're actually in the throne room with the credits playing, you could choose to speak to the watcher directly instead of sitting on your throne, but there is one sad detail about this. When you use the arrow on the dragon, you instantly cut to that post defeat screen and get the cinematics rolling. You don't get to see the really cool animation for the arrow at the scale that would be insane on a dragon. I use this on the Sphinx myself in my own playthrough, and you can see how the arrow bursts in bright yellow, shooting out these tendrils of light from the contact point. They start to spout quickly from all sides and kind of wrap the target in a killing grasp. Very cool stuff, and yeah, would have been really cool to see on the dragon. But still, it's a neat thing you can do. Next, let's talk about blatantly unused content plan for future updates maybe, or perhaps even DLC. At worst case, it could just be wasted ideas. What I'm talking about are scenes like this. Unfinished work, as referenced on Reddit by OK Calligrapher. In the cave near the Medusa cave, there's a weird ending, a ladder that leads down, and at the bottom, not necessarily a dead end. There's this archway that's covered with rubble and debris, and this might be a familiar sight to you because they appear in loads of caves around the game. Some old structures are buried behind these. Beyond it is actually something. In the comments of this reddit post discussing the topic, someone took it upon themselves to do a kind of no clip free cam and show what's there. As you can see, we can see beyond that buried archway, there's kind of an empty corridor leading to nothing. But the thing that separates you and that corridor is a hidden door. And an important one because it's, yes, a God's Bane door, which only one of those appears in the story we know today. This is the door with the God's Bane symbol that we need to use our God's Bane blade to open. We do that right before the Talos encounter. In this case, interestingly though, the symbol is green instead of the blue we know, which means the devs created these archways with at least some thought behind them. Could that be new content waiting for us? Could it be cut content from the story that we were meant to do and then they removed it? It does give them a way to add new stuff hidden behind these locations because like I said, there's a lot of these doors hidden around. It's just a question of why? In general, I think there's still a lot of hope for future content for DD2, but this is my first time seeing something that really screams that. But what do you think? Why is there so many unused God's Bane doors around the world? Next up, how about some really cool referencing to the first game? This one was mentioned in the comments of a previous video I made by Swag Hummus, which is a great name by the way. They're talking about how the seafloor shrine, that location that becomes our new hub in the unmoored world, once all the water's gone, is actually an important familiar location. It's the remnants of a location in DD1. This is actually Grand Soren, the city from the original that has now plunged down into the sea. Or maybe it's just where it always was, but the water levels have risen over many many years. So a specific detail that's awesome about this for me is there's a creator called Slovsky who would post these really cool details, different screenshots and images of different stuff from Elden Ring. When I was covering that, I'd showcase and talk about these relatively often. Slovsky's actually been covering Dragon's Dogma 2 recently. They've made this perfect comparison post for all the major shots of the original city compared to our current unmoored world version. It's absolutely blatantly the same place and it's just it's nice to see a real nod to the original. If you've played the first game a good amount, you may have realized this yourself with its familiar layout. It's truly one for one, as showcased by another creator on YouTube, the Gobbo, who took the time to really walk the sections in both games and put the content side by side to look at. So please check out both Slosky on Twitter and the Gobbo on YouTube for more interesting detailed comparisons on other work they produce. It's very appreciated, it's very cool to see. All right, so now we've had a few interesting reveals and considerations. Here's just a few fun tips, details, 
details to be aware of for your own actual gameplay. First up, the damn useless pawns and their launch or springboard abilities. When there's a ledge, you can't quite reach, but if you could just say levitate, you could. Meanwhile, your pawn is standing right there with levitate or springboard or launch or whatever. While it would be great if we had more direct control in these moments, there are ways to get this to work. Basically, you're gonna need a ledge that's out of reach and a ladder that's up there to kick down specifically. If a pawn has the ability to levitate, or in my case, a fighter with a springboard ability, they'll clock it and offer to help. In that moment, you can use the go command and they'll actually try it, which could get you to where you need to be, creating shortcuts or reaching those high up chests in those scenarios where you otherwise couldn't reach it. Unfortunately, this is still awkward as hell. In my example here, I was struggling with not one, not two, but three pawns that could do it. I'm standing right under the ladder and then not even aware of it. I had to spam the go command, moving around to different places until eventually they realized. But hopefully in the future, we can see a quality of life update to make this a lot more consistent. Or imagine, right, we could directly control our pawns and their weapon skills. If not that, why not make it so the pawns, when we talk to them, we can have them use, say, springboard right now where it's standing. Not a complicated concept. At least for now, we have a way to do it and yeah, this is how. Okay, how about just a funny one? A bit of a PSA. I've recently covered a lot of different movement techs, all the ones we could find for each vocation. Included in that were some incredible mystic spear hand options where you could stop your momentum midair, allowing for some leaps up into the air vertically, interrupting that, and now you can climb a bit higher. Really useful stuff. But today I'm talking about something that should work that does not for the poor spear hand. The actual purpose of the bolt is to be a kind of a wee snare and stun, or yeah, let you teleport to the contact location. Teleport is awesome in a lot of situations, but you want to be aware that it turns out it doesn't ignore gravity as a teleport should. If you choose a target below you, like in this Reddit clip by Frozen Dead, you will take that fall damage as normal. Only you will teleport. You'll appear at your target just smashed to the ground, having taken the fall damage mid face plan. Absolute shambles. But it did make me laugh to see, and it reminded me of that Yamcha crater meme. But yes, be aware that the teleport over the Mystic Spear Hand does not ignore fall damage, even though it absolutely should. So maybe one day we'll see like a fix or something. Okay, last one for the video and one that I learned a little bit too late. There's pots around the world, right? Introduced quite early in one of the side quests. You pick them up, you throw them, and you get different effects. One of the ones you're introduced to is the poison one that deals nice damage over time. It's very distinct, this purplish, gooey pot. But there are other kinds that are less distinct, but there is a way to tell them apart. For example, pots that are kind of brownish red will burst into oil. And when you throw these at an enemy, fire damage then becomes extremely potent. Fire is insane against hairy enemies, which have lots to burn in general. And if you oil those up first, it's just ridiculous the DPS you get. While the white pots, on the other hand, contain water, which will drench enemies when thrown. Drenched enemies can now be targeted with ice element to great effect. It will freeze these drenched targets extremely fast. Frozen targets are basically hard stunned. It's free DPS windows, it's critical attacks, it's ridiculously strong. Especially if we're talking about like a big proper enemy, getting a long extended free DPS window on like a vulnerable part is awesome. So just look out for pots a bit more if you haven't been using them very much. They're intentionally placed near enemies weak to them for a reason. And if you're fighting a bigger relevant enemy, there's a high chance that there's something like this in the environment to make use of of and really used to your advantage. So yeah, just be aware of them. I definitely haven't been using them enough, but there you have it. More things you might not have known with some really cool cut content or references even to the original. As always, if you have anything you'd add to these topics or something new to consider for a new video, drop it in the comments. We might just cover it and I'll credit you when we do, of course. For now though, I've been Hollow, you've been you. Thanks for watching. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye